is in the sanctuary, who is so great a God as our God. Thank you again, and I'm sorry that we had a little bit of a mess up, but thank you. Have a good day. No apologies necessary, brother. I think it all works out for God's glory. Amen? Amen. What a beautiful song. Amen? Thank you, Miss Mitzi, for singing that song, and Brother Max for playing such beautifully for us on the guitar, and, and even Brother Maurice for holding the mic for him. For <laughs> Well, uh, I'm looking forward to the day that I get good enough on the guitar to play in front of people. Uh, right now, I only know how to play five songs, and I'm not so confident that I can play in front of people yet, but uh, Matt, Brother Max, you did a wonderful job, brother. I highly respect that. Amen. Well, friends, it's good to be here this morning. Amen? Yes. Are you happy? Yes. You excited? Yes. yes? You got to think about that one? <laughs> well, friends, it's good to be here. I'm glad to be here. We have a wonderful topic ahead of us titled Revelation's Blueprint. And, friends, we're going to unlock the key to understanding the book of Revelation, and we're going to look at the sanctuary message this morning. A lot of people, I can't go into all of the depths of the sanctuary message, but I know somebody here who can. I know Brother Glenn has written a book on the sanctuary. Isn't that right, Brother Glenn? Yes. Brother Glenn has written a book, and so uh, he is very, probably a lot more knowledgeable than me on the sanctuary message. So you guys can go to him for uh, further information, because I'm not going to be able to cover everything. I'm just going to cover the basics this morning, because it's important that we know the basics. Amen? Very, very important. And this is an awesome message that's going to help us understand the book of Revelation better. Because, friends, the book of Revelation is all sanctuary message. It's a sanctuary uh, theme all the way through the book of Revelation. And so if you really don't understand the book of Revelation and, or, the, or the sanctuary message, and you can't really understand in its full context the book of Revelation. So we need to understand the sanctuary message. So this morning, I'm just going to kind of lay a foundation for us. We're going to talk about the basics and, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll be uh, getting ready for this afternoon for the Mark of the Beast. So before we dive into our presentation this evening, what should we do? Pray. We should pray. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, we're so thankful again for your love. We, only, we are only all here, Lord, this morning because of it. God, if it wasn't for your love and your grace and your mercy, Lord, none of us would be able, able to have the, the beautiful promises in your word, the beautiful salvation that you have so, so given us at Calvary's cross. And so, Lord, we, we are so grateful for that. And this morning, Lord, as we study your word, as we study the blueprint of the sanctuary, Lord, I pray that you will give us understanding and help us to take that understanding and apply it to our life because this message is probably one of the most important messages in the whole Bible, Lord. And I know you've showed that to me, and so I pray that you will show that to all of us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. So, Revelation's blueprint. In Exodus chapter 25 and beginning in verse 8, we read this. God says, And let them make me a what? A sanctuary that I may dwell among them. God has always wanted to dwell among us. Can you say amen? It was never God's plan for us to be separated from Him. He always wanted to be with us and, and, and to have that close uh, relationship with Him. But friends, we have went astray. We have turned everyone to our own way. And that's the reason why we need this sanctuary message is because the sanctuary message points to God and His way. You see, the reason why God told them to make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them is not so He could just dwell among them, but because as Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says, all we like sheep have gone what? Astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. Let's be honest. We all like our own way, don't we? Oh boy, I remember when I was a kid, uh, my dad... You know, he was, uh, he was one of those people that everything had to be just right, you know. And uh, he loved getting things right and done right. And I remember um, when I was a kid, I would have to help him with stuff. And he would t teach me how to do stuff and tell me how to do stuff. And if I didn't do it his way, oh boy, I, I, I would get out. He would get on to me. He'd say, he'd say, son, now that's not what I taught you. You got to do it this way. And he would show me the way he taught me how to do it. Well, friends, God has laid out His way for all of us. Amen? And His way, friends, is the way that we all should go. And we see that laid out in the sanctuary message. But you know, it's not in our nature to want to follow someone else's way. Isn't that right? We all think that we have it all figured out. We all think that it's our way is the best way. 
uh, whether it be that we've had some kind of family drama or some kind of situation that may be happening in our life, we think that we know what is the best way to figure it out. But friends, the reality is, is that we are all wicked, amen? And we need to have a heart and mind transformation. We need God to change our hearts, to change our minds, and to help us to see the beautiful gospel as it is in Jesus Christ so that we will follow His way and not our own way. And so Proverbs 14 and 12 says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We think that our way is going to lead to somewhere good, but friends, in reality, it leads to where? To death, no doubt about it. But God has given us a beautiful promise in His Word and told us where we could find His way. In Psalm 77, 13, you heard the Scripture reading this morning. It says, Thy way, O God, is where? In the sanctuary. And by the way, who is so great a God as our God? Now you can respond. <laughs> who is so great a God as our God? Is there any greater God than our God? No, in fact, there is no other God but our God. Amen? All the other gods are false and made up. Man's creation. But friends, our God has created all things. And He's told us where His way is at. And it is in the sanctuary message. In Exodus 25, when he said, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, God was wanting to plan and show them his way personally through the sanctuary message. And we know that, again, God wanted to dwell with his people. We see this was even the case in Matthew 1 23, when it said, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring, and they shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name what? Emmanuel, which being interpreted means what? God with us. See, God wants to be with us. And He wants to show us His way. Just as God gave them the sanctuary to be with them, to show Him His way, Jesus also was manifested in the flesh to be with us, to show us His way. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. And so, no doubt about it, God is wanting to be with us. But I have a question for us all this morning. Does God only abide in temples and in buildings? See, we get this concept that God only abides in temples and buildings, and we act like Christians at church, but we don't act like Christians outside of church. Is, we've all fallen under that banner sometimes, and we've all said things and done things, and you know, we even, we even watch things that we wouldn't watch at church. <laughs> we say things that we wouldn't search. We listen to things that sometimes we wouldn't listen to at church. But friends, you see, God is not just abiding in temples and buildings where, yes, we come here and we act all good when we're in His presence, but God is with us always. Can you say Amen. He wants to abide in us. We see in Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 19, he says, Now therefore, if you are no more, you are no more strangers, rather, and foreigners, but fellow what? Fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. Notice what he says about the saints and the household. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the what? Being the chief cornerstone. Now, I want to explain to you the language of this, of this real quickly here. You see, when they would build the sanctuary... They would, they, would take the build, they, would, they would take a stone. They would go into the quarry and they would have to cut out a stone. And what they would do is they would go in first and they would cut out what was called the chief cornerstone. Can you say amen? The chief cornerstone had to be perfect. It had to be spotless. No blemishes, no scratches, no dents, no nicks, nothing. That stone had to be perfect. And every other stone that was to be a part of the sanctuary must be tested and look just like the chief cornerstone. Can you say amen? And if it did not look like the chief cornerstone, if there was found scratches or nicks or blemishes of any kind, it was not to be a part of God's sanctuary building. Can you say amen? So right here, he's telling us, you and I are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the what? He is our example. Can you say amen? Jesus is our example, and we all must be like Him. That's a high calling, isn't it? And for a lot of people, they say that's impossible. But all things are possible with Jesus. Can you say amen? What did Jesus say in Matthew 19, 26? He said, with men, this is what? Impossible. So if we work and try real hard, I'm going to white knuckle it, and I'm going to do it myself. It's impossible. We'll, we'll always fail, which is why so many of us have failed so often. Because we try white knuckling it. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to do this. And because we're trying in and of ourselves, we fail. But what did he go on to say? But with God, how many things are possible? 
all things. You have obstacles in your life. You got problems in your life, friends. Go to God who can give you the victory over those obstacles in your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. He is offering us the plan of salvation. And so right here, he is the chief cornerstone. It goes on to say, in whom all the building... Is it talking about a building? Yes. Yes. In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the what? In the Lord. Friends, notice what it says here. In whom ye also are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. It just said that each and every single one of us are like a stone. We're like a part of that, uh, 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 of the sanctuary itself. We are all builded together. And we make up God's people. Can you say amen? We make up His abode where He abides. We all are very important to God in that building being fitly framed together. And we have to let Him do that polishing on us. Can you say amen? Work out those blemishes and work out those imperfections. You know, that's what they would do. They would go in. If there was a stone that wasn't cut just right, if it had something wrong with it, they would have to, they would have to go through and they'd have to polish it. And they'd have to make everything, get rid of any of those problems that was wrong with that stone so that it can be a part of the sanctuary. Can you say amen? That is what Jesus wants to do for you and I. He wants to polish us. He wants to cut out and, and do away with any imperfections that may be there. He goes on to say, Abide in me, and I where? In you. Now, friends, Jesus is telling us, he, He's inviting us to make our abode in Him. He says, if we will abide in Him, then He will abide in us. It's conditional. Can you say amen? Jesus will not abide in a temple that ignores Him. Can someone say amen? If we are, we're all referred to as a temple or sanctuary, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? God will not abide in a temple that ignores Him. He demands our attention that if we will abide in Him, He then will abide in us. What does it mean to really abide in God? A lot of people think that they have this concept figured out, but friends, this is a deep concept that we need to make sure that we have the right answer to. Abiding in God is simple as this. John chapter 1 and verse 1. What does it say? In the beginning was what? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was what? With God, and the Word was God. So the Word is who? God. Is that biblical? Yes, it is. So friends, when you spend time in the Word, you are henceforth spending time in Christ. Can you say amen? And when you spend time in, in, in the Word... Guess what you get in, 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 in I guess you could say, in, in, in part of spending time in the Word? You get faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the what? The Word of God. So when you spend time in Christ, you will obtain Christ's faith. Not your own faith, Christ's faith. And friends, it is only the faith of Jesus that will get us through to the end. Not our own faith. Open up your Bibles to Revelation chapter 14 for one moment. Revelation chapter 14, where we read about the three angels' messages that should go to all of the world. These three angels' messages that's going to all the world. Tonight, we're going to be studying in depth the, thir the third angel's message, which is, Do not worship the beast, nor accept its mark. Amen? Amen. We're going to be looking at that message tonight at 530 but look at verse 12 of Revelation chapter 14. Are you there? Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Say a good amen when we're there. Amen. amen. Let's begin reading in verse 12. It says, Here is the patience of the what? Are we saints? I certainly hope so. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. So these are, are, are an obedient people in the last days. And do they have their own faith? Whose faith do they have? The faith of Jesus. Friends, this faith that it's speaking of is a possessive faith. This is a faith that you just don't have in and of yourself. This is a faith that is a possessive faith. Are you with me? Not faith in Jesus. The faith of Jesus. These are our people that have been purged to be a part of that sanctuary. 
a special people that would be fit to go through the last days, no doubt about it. And so we see that God is inviting you and I to abide in Him, in His Word, to take on not our own faith, but to take on His faith. What kind of faith did Jesus have? Would you say that he had a perfect faith? I would say he had a perfect faith. You see, Jesus did nothing independently. Can you say amen? He did nothing independently. He remained 100% dependent upon his Father. So you and I must have faith of Jesus to remain 100% dependent upon Jesus to do what he said he would do. Amen? That's the faith that we have to have in the last days. And friends, if we don't have that faith, we need to be striving and pressing toward the mark, as Paul said, of the prize of Jesus Christ. You see, we all run in a race, amen? And it doesn't matter the speed or, or, or the way you run as long as you finish the race. Amen? And so in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 16, it says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of whom? We are the temple of God. In another part, he says, the, Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, And the Spirit of God dwelleth where? In you. He says, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God, what? Destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Friends, you are holy in God's eyes. But if we defile our temples, then our temples will become unholy in God's eyes. Can you say amen? And so God is telling us that if anyone defiles this temple that he has created, that was for meant for his habitation, is that not what Paul just said? That we were made as a habitation of God through the Spirit? He wants to make his abode in us. He wants to inhabit us. Can you say amen? To abide in and through us. And so if we want to know how to run this temple then maybe we should study the old temple. Can you say amen? We need to, when we want to learn how to run this sanctuary that God has given us, then we need to learn and understand how God ran His old sanctuary. Can you say amen? See, friends, the old sanctuary is very, very important. We see here, where did the blueprints for the sanctuary come from? God, no doubt about it. But check this out. There's a very specific answer I'm looking for here. And we, we want to get this straight from the Bible. Exodus 25 and verse 40. He says, And look that thou, uh, it says, look that thou make them after the pattern which was showed thee in the mount. Speaking about the sanctuary. So when Moses went up to meet God on Mount Sinai, he gave him the blueprints. What's our revelation, our, our, our subject tonight, or this morning titled? Revelations what? Blueprints. So he gave Moses the blueprints as to how to make the sanctuary. He gave him the blueprints. Now, the question is, where did those blueprints come from? We can say, well, from God, but there's more of a specific answer in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow of what kind of things? Heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the what? So was the tabernacle that was made on earth, was it made as some kind of made up thing that God told them to do? No. What was it serving as an example of? Heavenly things. So when Moses was given the sanctuary blueprints to make the sanctuary, it was because God was showing him the blueprints of the heavenly sanctuary. Can you say amen? Did you know there's a heavenly sanctuary? And God was showing Moses those blueprints. He says, when he, was among, when, when he was about to make the tabernacle, for see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed thee in the mount. Friends, the sanctuary message is God's GPS. It's his gospel plan of salvation. Amen? Now, what, what is a GPS for? What is it supposed to do? It's supposed to what? Get you to your destination, right? Now, where do we all want to go? Heaven. Heaven, amen? We want to be at, we're in point A, or you could get, I guess you could say point H. We're in what we would all kind of consider a, 
a living hell, so to speak. And I'm not cursing, I'm just saying. And, and that, the, and that term, terminology that we use there, there's this world's chaos, is it not? We're living in chaos. We want to get from chaos to absolute peace and happiness. Amen? Amen. That's where we want to be. And so a GPS is designed to get you from point A to point B. Well, friends, this GPS that God has given us, this gospel plan of salvation, it all points to Jesus. The whole thing is about Jesus. Who is our Savior? Jesus Christ. So this whole plan of salvation is going to point to Him. What did Jesus say in John 12, 32? He said, And I, if I be lifted up, then I will draw how many? All men unto me. So it is mine and your job to do the lifting up. Can you say amen? Even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Can you say amen? What was that story about in the wilderness when he lifted up the serpent? They were all being bitten by what? By poisonous snakes, serpents. And, and, and as they're, they're out there, and here's why they're being bitten. They're complaining. <laughs> How many of us have been guilty of complaining? Go ahead and raise our hands. I've got to raise two. We've all been guilty of complaining, no doubt. They're over there complaining. We want our, we want our Nile cakes. Where did they just spent the last 400 years? Egypt. They like that Nile River. They like their little Nile cakes, their little Egypt cakes. And they like all the stuff they used to wear. All the stuff they used to do. It had become a part of who they were. And, and they got out there and they started complaining. God, God set them free. Have mercy from slavery. And what did they end up doing? Complaining about it. God's leading them to the promised land. And in the midst of leading them to the promised land, they suffer some trials. And because they're suffering some trials, they got to complain about it. <laughs> Are we being led? Is God leading us to the promised land? Amen? Yes. We all want to get from point A, the wilderness, into point B. Amen? Along the way, sometimes we start complaining. <laughs> and God was sending them a test. And so what He did is He sent these serpents. And these serpents come up and they start biting the children of Israel. And the point is this, is that he's wanting to get them to realize that where they're at, where they got there, was because of sin. Can you say amen? amen. You see, the, the situation was, why of all things did God have them to lift up a serpent on a pole? He could have told Moses, hey, listen, I want you to, I'm going to speak something into existence here. He could have spoke a cross or spoke anything to existence. He, but he told him, you take one of the, a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole. Any man that looks a bit on it, though he is bitten, shall live. Why look to a curse? Was the serpent a cursed beast? Why look to a curse at that point? Friends, I think in some ways God was trying to remind them of why they're there. Why did they wonder for 40 years in the wilderness? Because of their rebellion. Here we are living in a world, friends, that is so sinful. And we're wondering in this world. We keep wondering, why hasn't Jesus come back yet? Because we're still rebellious. Can you say amen? amen? We are still rebelling against God rather than doing what we should be doing. We're rebelling against Him. And so we keep wondering just as the world is wondering after the beast. And so here we are wandering in the wilderness, and God is trying to remind us of how we got here. We forget sometimes that we're sinners and that we need a Savior. Don't we? We forget sometimes why everything's falling apart. It's because there's an enemy. And so he tells them to take the serpent put up on a pole that if anyone would look, they, though they're bitten, they shall live. Sounds crazy, right? I'm going to look upon the thing that bit me and, and that's going to save me? See, friends, the key is obedience, that if we trust God, no matter what He tells us to do, 
we can trust Him. We will live. So this whole sanctuary message points to Jesus, friends, and how He will save us in this, or rather from this world and from all the sin in it. Amen? See, here's an artist's portrayal of the sanctuary message right here. Um, and this is the only thing that would be a little bit off in this picture here is that all of these tents and all of these, uh, these camps that you can see set up near the sanctuary, they would have been a ways away. That would have been a, quite a ways away. It wouldn't have been that close to the sanctuary. And so this was, again, a, just an artist's portrayal. And then here's another one. This is viewing what was referred to as the courtyard. So this whole area right here that you see where there's two articles of furniture inside the courtyard here. This is the courtyard, and there's two articles of furniture inside the courtyard. Now again, the sanctuary all points to who? Jesus. So let's see if we can find Jesus. The altar of sacrifice. Guess what would happen on the altar of sacrifice? Now what I'm about to describe to you is referred to as the daily. It's referred to as the what? The daily. There was 360 years, or 360 days rather, in a biblical year. Amen? 360 days in a biblical year. 359 days. How many days? 359 days out of, those, uh, out of that year, the priest would perform what was referred to as the daily service. Are you with me? The daily service. So what I'm describing to you now was referred to as the daily service. There would be a... So the sinner who sinned, that'd be you and I. Let's say we lived out in the wilderness at this time. Let's use our imaginations. Can we do that? You guys should see your faces from my point of view. <laughs> Some of you look like you're about to fall asleep. <laughs> now, can we do that, though? Can we use our imaginations? Yes. Amen. Okay, so here's the thing. So God is, is set up the sanctuary, and, and everyone pitches their tents far away from the sanctuary. So the, the, the Word of God went on to say that if anyone sinned, and anyone committed a sin, in order for them to have forgiveness of that sin, they had to provide a perfect sacrifice. Can you say Amen. It would have been a little baby lamb. And so they would have had to take their lamb. Get this. We're all living together. We're all out there in the wilderness. And they would have had to take their little baby lamb. And they would have had to walk it all the way to the sanctuary. Now imagine this. I've committed a sin. I've committed a, an absolute transgression of God's law. And I have to pick up my lamb. Spotless, without blemish. And I have to carry my lamb all the way down to the sanctuary. And all you guys are sitting out. Oh, ah, there goes Dakota again. Boy, I tell you what, he must have done something bad this time. Are you seeing? And so everyone would have been seeing the sinner having to do something what we call humble ourselves. Which took humility. Can you say amen? This was, this was uh, an act of humility to say, I am a sinner. That's the first step in order for you to have salvation. Can you say amen? We have to admit that we are a sinner. And we have to be willing to, to, to take our, our sacrifice before God. Can you say amen? And, and so, so Jesus, Jesus would be represented as the Lamb of God. Can you say Amen which takes away the sin of the world. So that little lamb that I'm carrying to the sanctuary is representation of Jesus, the Messiah that would soon to come. And so I'd have to take that lamb. It would, it would be slain. Before they would slay it, they would, they would pray over that. Isn't that right? They would pray over that lamb that the sins of the sinner, me, would be transferred from me to that beautiful, perfect, spotless lamb. And then that lamb, once the sins are transferred, it would be slain. Can you say amen? Now, now here's the thing. Here's the thing. That lamb symbolized Jesus. That, that lamb is now laid on the altar of sacrifice and is served up as a burnt offering. Can you say amen? This all pointed to us accepting Jesus Christ as our sacrifice. Now, then we would move over the priest, at this point, the sinner's job is done. Now the priest will take care of the rest of it from here, the high priest. And the priest would have to go over into the next. He would move from 
the altar of sacrifice over to the next article of furniture, which was referred to as the laver. You know your Bibles, amen? And see, in the process of, that, of that, that lamb being slain, the priest oftentimes would get blood on his hands. Now keep in mind, the blood would be a symbol of what? Jesus' life, but what was transferred into that lamb? The sin. So now, the priest cannot walk before the presence of God, are you with me? Contaminated. So now, there must be a cleansing, there must be a washing. So now he has to walk to the labor and he has to wash his hands free of the sin. Are you with me? This is a symbol, friends, of baptism. Can someone say amen? amen. Are you getting happy yet? Yes. Some of you may have already known this, but this is amazing. This points to the literal plan of salvation. This lays out for how you and I come to Jesus. How you and I literally go through the steps to Christ. Go through the steps of sanctification in our life. So check this out. So now the priest will wash the sin off of his hands, and now he would, he would have, he'd have that blood, he would have it caught like a little bowl of some sort, and he would have to take a censer, and he would have to take that blood into what was referred to in, the, in, in this part of the veil as the holy place. The holy place. And so, here's kind of an inside portrayal of what the sanctuary would have looked like. So, inside the sanctuary, from here on, from where this blue veil separates it here, from here on, this is referred to as the holy place. Now, there was three articles of furniture in the holy place. How many? Three. three. One of those, the ones that you would have saw, was the seven-branch candlestick or the seven-branch lampstand. This was a symbol of several things, which I'm about to get into in a moment, but it was the only light source of the sanctuary. Is God referred to as the light of the world? Yes. He is, isn't He? Jesus is referred to as the light of the world. And what would be a part, what would keep that fire burning would be the oil that was in the lamp. Can you say amen? Now, oil in the Bible is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Amen? You can read Zechariah chapter 4 to get that understanding, no doubt about it. But the priest would then, that was the light source, the seven-branch candlestick, and so the priest would then go over and he would eat of the table of showbread where there was 12 loaves on the table of showbread. Now, how many tribes in Israel were there? Twelve tribes. How many disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. I could go on. There's a lot more significance of that number, but I don't have time to go all the way into that. So, the table of showbread, he would eat of that table of showbread. And was Jesus referred to as the bread of life? Yes, he was. Are you seeing how this all points to Jesus? Yes. So now, the, after eating it, he would walk to what was referred to as the altar of incense... And on the altar of incense, he would take his censer and he would sprinkle the blood, touch the blood to the four corners of the altar and sprinkle it up on the altar of incense. That, that, that the smoke of the burning there would ascend over the veil. And this picture kind of has it backwards here. Like I said, this isn't all accurate. It would symbolize that, that smoke ascending over the veil into what was called the most holy place. Are you with me? Now, in the most holy place... That was where you had the presence of God, the Shekinah glory, the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? Now again, what I just described to you was referred to as what kind of service? The daily service. 359 days out of the year, this would happen every day. And so the priest would, again, the smoke would ascend up over it, symbolizing that that sinner's plea for forgiveness as accepting the Messiah as his sacrifice was accepted and presented before the presence of God. Are you with me? Now, in, but on this veil here, as you see in this picture, was, the, alt, or was the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was, again, a symbol or representation of the throne of God. It was also referred to as the mercy seat in the Bible. Now, what's the foundation of God's throne? His law. The Ten Commandments are the foundation of God's throne. And so it's very important for us to understand that. It was placed on the inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, the priest would not go into the most holy place, but only one time out of the year. How many times? Once. Only one day out of the entire year would the priest move from the, holy, from the holy place to the most holy place. And that was on the Day of Atonement. Now, I'm not going to get into that now because there's too much information there for me to get into. I, I don't have enough time for that. But I'm sure... 
Pastor Grahams and Pastor Glenn and Brother West and some of these other gentlemen in here that's very well studied on this will be able to help you guys understand the, the rest of this. Amen? Yes. So I trust you gentlemen. You guys got it taken care of? Just raise your hand in affirmation if you got it taken care of. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. So in the Ark, the Ark of the Covenant then was the presence of God, the Shekinah glory. And only one day out of the year would the priest go in to do what was referred to uh, as the cleansing of the sanctuary. You see, sin, all that blood, had been coming into the sanctuary day after day after day after day, 359 days out of the year. So all the sins coming into the sanctuary symbolically and being presented before God, but on the Day of Atonement was known as a day of cleansing. Can you say amen? amen. It would be a day of cleansing the sanctuary from sin. Can you say amen? And so that is a process I'll allow Brother Wes and Bro Pastor Grahams and Pastor Glenn to take you guys through on, on, on their own time. But the sanctuary, friends, it all pointed to Jesus and how He would save us from our sins and have true salvation in and through Him. And so... Let's look at this for a moment. Check this out. So number one, you have the altar of sacrifice. You have the labor that he would go through. Then the table of showbread. The altar of incense. The seven branch candlestick. And then the Ark of the Covenant. Now, now watch this. I'm just going to let it sink in. Just take it in. Isn't it amazing yes. that the sanctuary itself was an outline of what Jesus done on the cross? Amen. Did you know that every exact place where there's an article of furniture in the sanctuary, our Savior was wounded? Ah, check this out. Check this out. Was he nailed at the feet? Yes. yes. Was he nailed at both hands? Yes. yes. Did he have a crown of thorns on his head? Yes. yes. Did he die of a broken heart? Yes, that was a part of what uh, asphyxiation and, and heart attack, a stroke, what uh, crucifixion would cause. Now, check this out. Remember, the last wound that he'd taken was after he had died. Isn't that right? After he died, there was a man, a centurion, standing nearby, and he saw Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And then he, he, he saw Jesus cry out and say, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He beheld this. And as he's beholding, just as, just as the thief on the cross is looking at this man being nailed to the cross who don't deserve anything, he looked at that and he said, this man has done nothing wrong. We are worthy. Are you with me? We are worthy of the stripes and, uh, and, uh, and of the punishment that we are getting. But this man has done nothing wrong. The centurion man looked up on the cross and he said, truly, this man is the Son of God. He understood what it pointed to. Now, check this out. Check this out. Then the centurion soldier comes along. Some other soldier, I'm sure, come along later. And he had to, they had to test Jesus to see if he was still alive. And they were going through breaking the legs. Well, this, they said, I think he's already dead. And they wanted to have a little fun. And they're like, okay, well, we'll see if he's really dead. So they spear him in his side. Where's your side? Right here, right? They spear him in his side. And what come flowing out of his side? Isn't that awesome? What was inside the laver? Blood and water. It's amazing, friends. It's amazing that this all points to Jesus Christ and what He did for us on the cross. See, number one, Christ pointing to the, pointing to the, the altar of sacrifice. Jesus Christ was our sacrifice. Amen? Yes. He was the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. Number two, the laver. Jesus is described as being the fountain of life in Jeremiah 2.13. Number three, the bread of life, John 6.35 and 48. Jesus is referred to as the bread of life. Amen. That we need to eat of daily, just as the priest would eat of it daily. Number four, is Jesus our example of prayer? Luke 11 and 2. Yes, He is our example of prayer. Here's the thing, friends. Is that the altar of incense symbolized prayer. And the prayer of the saints, the acceptance of that being going over and ascending over the veil into the literal presence of God. And so, yes, Jesus is our example of prayer. Number five, the seven branch candlestick, the light source of the whole sanctuary, is Jesus the light of the world? Yes, he was referred to as the light of the world in John 8 and verse 12. This all points to Jesus and what he done for us on the cross. It's powerful. And so the plan of salvation has literally been laid out in the sanctuary message. But check this out. 
Number one, this lays out our, our, our steps to salvation and our steps to Jesus. Check this out. Number one, must we accept Christ as our sacrifice? Yes, according to Romans 10 and 9. We must accept Christ as our sacrifice. That is our first stage in becoming a Christian. That we have to accept what He done for us on Calvary's cross. Number two, must we be baptized? Yes, it is, a, it is an outward profession of our faith in Jesus and a symbol to all that has seen us and known us in our life that our, our inward man is being renewed. Can you say amen? Even though our outward man is, is perishing, our inward man is being renewed. It was a symbol of death, of dying to self. When you, when you go and you get baptized, what do you do? You hold your breath, don't you? You take a deep breath. <gasps> What's breath a symbol of? Breath is a symbol of life. Amen? And so when you hold your breath, it's a symbol of death. And then you go into the watery graves of baptism, as, as Paul referred to it as. And you get laid to rest in the watery graves of baptism, and you get raised up out of the water. And what's the first thing you do when you're raised up out of that water? You take in a deep breath, and, and, and guess what? That's, that new breath is a symbol of new life in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, what does it say? I'll wait. What does it say? 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Somebody look it up for me. What does it say? I got it all day. I'll just wait. Second Corinthians 5 and 17. Somebody read it when you get it. If any man is in Christ, behold, he is a new creature. creature. Notice, if any man is in Christ. You become a new creature. All things are all passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You, you die to self. You get raised up a new man. That's what it's a symbol of. Amen? Dying to self. Number three, must we eat of the word daily? Yes. What is the bread of life a symbol of? His word. What, what, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. What, Jesus is Jesus being tempted by the devil to turn the stones into bread. But what does he say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Friends, the bread of life is a symbol of God's word. Must we eat of the bread daily? Yes. The bread of life, daily. And friends, if we don't eat of the bread daily, what happens if you don't eat daily? We starve ourselves. Do you know Job? When you go and you read, I like to call it the gospel of Job. When you go and you read Job's message, Job said he esteemed the word of God more than his necessary food. That means before he woke up and go, hmm, pancakes. He, he, he said, I got to go to what's more necessary in my life before I go to any food the world can give me. And he went to the bread of life. Friends, we must eat of the word daily. Now, here's the thing. Most people will come. Yes, they will accept Christ as their sacrifice. Yes, they'll even go as far as getting baptized. But the question is, do they do these three things inside the holy place? Do they have a holy place experience with God? Do they eat of the word daily? Number four, we must pray. Do we get alone with God and commune with Him in prayer daily? What was kind of service was this service called? The daily service. Every day, praying, eating of the word. And then moving on to the next one. What was the next one? The candlestick which was the light source of the sanctuary, Jesus told us, He said, yes, I am the light of the world, but He has commanded us to be the light of the world as well. Can you say amen? That our light 
should shine before men. Now, friends, check this out. We must let our light shine. The sanctuary service, the three things in the sanctuary service here, these three things in the sanctuary service, eating of the Word daily, the Bible, the Word of God, praying to God daily, the altar of incense, and witnessing, letting your light shine before men daily, those are what I like to call the three legs of the stool. Can a stool stand on two legs? Do this right here. A stool can only stand if it has at least three legs. You and I cannot stand for Jesus if we don't do these three things daily. If we only do two, which is what most of us do, we may pray, we may read, but are we sharing the light that God has imparted to us? People say to me all the time, I say, Dakota, it's amazing to me. How do you remember the scriptures the way you do? And they go to Doug Batchelor and I say, oh, Doug Batchelor, man, you're so, wow, man, you're wise, man. How do you remember the scriptures that you remember? How do you know all these things? And he'll tell you and I'll tell you. Friends, we share it. The more you talk about the scripture, the more it gets seared and branded into your heart and mind. And it won't leave. The more you share it, the more you talk about it. But if you just read it, uh huh, that's good. Set it on your nightstand and go throughout your day, and you don't share it, it'll go through one ear, and you know the rest. Am I wrong or am I right? Friends, but if we will put it to application in our life, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If you and I were really doing the first two things, are you hearing me? If we would eat of the Word daily, and we would pray daily, the fifth one would follow by natural application. Let me tell you something. When you, when you open this Word, and you get in it, and you really give God your time, and you're genuine about it, God will share with you treasures in this Word that you are just like, whoa! What? Let me tell you something. I've been doing Bible studies. I've done Bible studies before. And I've listened to messages before. And when you hear them, how many of you have ever heard a message that you just can't sit still? You just heard that message. You're just like, oh, man. And if you can't relate to what I'm saying, have mercy. Friends, when you hear the matchless charms of Jesus and you see the treasures in his word, you, it's like live, rivers of living water. They got to go somewhere. <laughs> they got to come out of you. They got to go somewhere. And, and, and you got to share that with other people. It's naturally, it happens naturally. But if you are not praying daily and you do not study daily, then you won't witness daily. And friends, this is a lesson for all of us, even those that have been in the church for years. Amen? Amen? So right here, when we do the holy place experience daily, when we have a holy place experience with God daily, we will fulfill the commandments. If we will do one, two, three, four, five, number six will follow just like number five follows naturally, number six will follow naturally. You got problems breaking God's law? Welcome to the club. We've all been there, no doubt about it. We've all had problems breaking God's law. But here's the thing. If we focus on the do, the do, the do, then we're taking our eyes off the one who can help us to do. Can you say amen? But when we get our eyes on Jesus and we see what the Bible's really about, how it's really revealing Jesus, then, then and we pray that we do these things daily... When we do those things daily, when we do one, two, three, and four daily, number five will follow naturally, we will naturally witness for Jesus, and we will naturally obey His law. Why? Because we are falling in love with Jesus. And when you fall in love with somebody, you'll do anything for that person. And you don't do it because they ask you. You do it because you love them. Now, sometimes we can't relate to that. Because we haven't known true love. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I don't know. 
But I'll tell you this, with my wife, there's, there's nights and I go to bed and I know my wife's had a bad day, a rough day. And my wife can testify. I'm not trying to raise myself up here, honey, and she knows that. But I, she loves it when I rub her back at night. How many of you like a good back rub? One person. Brother Maurice, you're the only one that can relate to me right now, apparently. How many else likes a good back rub? Come on now. And, and because I love her and I know what she wants, I naturally will say, honey, I'll rub your back tonight. Honey, do I do that? I do that, don't I? Because I love her. She doesn't have to ask me to do it. I want to do it. And are you with me? So the same thing comes with Jesus. When we fall in love with Jesus, we will naturally want to follow and keep His law and obey His law. Friends, this is God's GPS. Now here's the thing, though. I've got to share something with you. Here's what most Christians do. What's on the screen here? The altar of sacrifice, right? Here's what most Christians do. They come to the altar of sacrifice... And they say, Lord, I accept you as my sacrifice. I heard what you did for me on Calvary's cross. I accept you as my sacrifice. And that's it. That's it. Most people don't even get baptized anymore. It's true. Am I wrong? Am I right? It's true. Most people, they don't have a daily holy place experience with Jesus because they're stuck in the courtyard. They're in the courtyard saying, Lord, I accept you as my sacrifice. They don't understand that the Christian life is progressive. They got to walk to the laver, get baptized. Then they got to walk into the holy place and go through the, 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 the function of the holy place. Eating of the word of God daily. Studying and, and getting alone with God. Communing with God in prayer daily. And, and, and going and witnessing Daily. They don't have that in their life. Why? Because all they're told that they have to do is accept Jesus as their, sac- as their sacrifice. That's it. And so now you have a bunch of hypocrites out in the world. And here's the thing. Here's what's sad. The majority of them don't even know they're hypocrites. They can't see their own problem because they're not in the book. They're not studying. They're not eating of the bread of life daily. And have mercy if you tell someone, ah, that's actually not biblical, that's not wrong. Ah, they get offended. But friends, nevertheless, if we love them, we must tell them the truth. Amen? We have a high calling. We must tell them the truth. You know, when Jesus was walking on the road to Emmaus, we, taught, we, we studied that a couple of weeks ago, did we not? The road to Emmaus. How many of you remember that message? We studied that message. He's rocking on the road to Emmaus, and as he he sees these two disciples of his, he conceals his identity from them. And he appears to walk with them. And they're walking along the way, and they're just like, oh, man. And they're talking about, I can't believe this happened, man. I thought he was supposed to reign a thousand years, and and we're supposed to declare independence from Rome. And and Jesus comes along, and he hides his identity. He says, what manner of communication do you have among you right now? And they look at him like, what? Have you not been in the area? Have you not seen what happened? How, how Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, how he died on Calvary's cross. And, and, but they don't understand the significance of it. And so Jesus, because of his love for them, tells them something. You know what he tells them? He tells them that they're blind. He tells them that they're blind. That they really don't have eyes to see nor ears to hear. And then he proves it to them by giving them a Bible study. All about himself. Friends, if we would do this with our loved ones, can you say amen? If we would do this with our friends, if we would stop trying to approach them with the same way we've always been approaching them, but point them to Jesus. Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up. Get this. He said, if I be lifted up, I, him, will draw all men unto him. Whose job is it to draw men to Jesus? Jesus' job. Whose job is it to uplift Jesus? Our job. So friends, we need to point them to Jesus. We need to point them to his way. 
point them to Him. And if we point them to Him, Jesus will take care of the rest. Can you say amen? Jesus will convict them about what they need to humble themselves about so that they can learn from other Christians, so that they can learn from other people and learn in His Word to see the truth. Friends, Jesus is coming again. And when He comes back in the clouds of heaven, we all need to be ready. And I want you to ask yourself a question, and I'm going to even ask myself this question, and we all can just ask ourselves this question in our mind. Are we having a holy place experience with Jesus? Or are we stuck in the courtyard? Which one is it? Are you praying daily but not studying daily? Maybe you've, you've encountered one article of the furniture in the holy place, but you have forgotten about the other two. Friends, they all must flow together. If any of them are missing, you do not have the true gospel. You have the false gospel. If any of them are missing... Sadly to say, 98% of Christianity, friends, has the false gospel because they don't understand the true message of salvation. They've bought into this idea of saying a prayer and that's all you've got to do and you're saved. And they tell me, they say, I got saved. <laughs> well, salvation isn't something that you got. Salvation is something that happens daily. Amen? People come to me and they say, Oh, Dakota... I got saved back in 1974. Sorry. True salvation is daily. You don't get saved. You continue to be saved. Can you say amen? amen. Salvation is continual. It's not you said that one prayer, now you're saved from sins, past, present, and future. That's not how it works. That's the false gospel. That's getting stuck at the altar of sacrifice but not following through. Amen? Amen? And so, friends, salvation is daily, moment by moment, day by day. Luke 9 and 23, Jesus says, If any man will come after me. How many of you want to go after Jesus? He says, If any man will come after me, let him do these things. Deny himself. It's first step. Second step. Take up his cross. Guess how often? Daily. He didn't say, and take up his cross, period. Because then that, I got saved, would be right. He said, take up his cross daily. Now, a cross was a symbol of death. Can you say amen? Yes. To the Hebrew, it was a symbol of death. He was inviting them to die to yourself daily. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. That's the lifestyle of a true Christian. And constant surrender to Jesus. But we don't want to hear that nowadays. And Christianity doesn't want to hear that nowadays. They want to hear that it's something that they done long ago and they done did that. Well, hold on a second. The, the fact that you've done did that is that you're still doing it. Proof of the fact that you done did that is that you're still doing it. But if you say, I done did that and you're not still doing it, well, then you didn't done did that. No, that was really confusing, but I had to put it that way. Friends, Jesus is coming again. How many of you want to be ready? Then we need to find ourselves not only in the courtyard. We need to move through the courtyard into the holy place. And when we get in the holy place and we do those three, when we have the three legs of the stool in our life, friends, when we do those things, when God, what, what was the point of the priest moving into the the most holy place. What was the point of that? Where was he moving into? He was moving into something that was important. What was it that was so important in there? Where was he moving into? The presence of God. Yes. Jesus is going to be in our presence soon. Yes. And if we haven't been having a holy place experience with him then when He comes, we will have a most holy place experience with Him. And friends, when the high priest, if he walked into the Shekinah glory, if he walked on the Day of Atonement into the most holy place with sin in his life, he dropped dead. Are you with me? So we need to have a holy place experience so that when our most holy place experience is there, we're prepared. We've been following it. 
Amen? Amen. I want you to stand with me and let's have a word of prayer together. Now let's ask God to help us to be ready for that most holy place experience. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, so much for your love, your grace, and your mercy. God, I ask you, Lord, that you will help us all to be prepared for that most holy place experience. God, we know you're coming someday. We know, Lord, that you're going to lighten this sky, lighten the darkness of this world with all of your glory. And Lord, we need to be ready. So we ask you, God, to help us to have a holy place experience with you daily. It was referred to as the daily service, Lord. Help us to have that daily service with you every day. God, so that when you come back in all your power and all your glory, we will not find ourselves ashamed of your appearing, but we will find ourselves not ashamed, looking into you, the author and finisher of our faith, with smiles on our faces. Lord, that's the experience we want to have. Let that be a reality and work the transformation upon our hearts and our minds now that we will be prepared for that day. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.